good morning again. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming out and just to worship Jesus. And it's, it's, it's good to be among you. And I hope that you're enjoying the fact that you're with your brothers and sisters in the house of God. This is an amazing opportunity that we have to seek after God together collectively. And uh, I hope you don't take it for granted. And I'm excited and uh, grateful that you choose to do it here, that you're here this morning. So if you've been with us, uh, we're just wrapping up a series uh, last week where we were talking about seeking and finding. Jesus said, if you seek me with all that you are, with all of your heart, you will find me. To seek first the kingdom of God, to seek first the righteousness of God and all the other stuff. That we, that we strive for and chase after in life. Like, what am I going to wear? What, where, where am I going to live? What's, what, what am I going to eat today? All those things, God says, if you just put me first in your life, put me in that preeminent place in your heart and in your life, I'll, I'll take care of everything you need. Maybe not what, what the things you, that you think you need, but what God knows that you need. God says, I will add that to you. Last week, we, we uh, talked about how in John chapter 1, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, right? The word, you'll obey, you'll obey what the word of God says, what Jesus instructs us to do, uh, the word, the speaking of God, right? The logos, John chapter 1 says, it's this, this, this speaking, the logic, the reason of God. And Jesus said, if, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll obey what I Say In my studies, I've been reading the book of James, and I came across this familiar text. Uh, James says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And, and as I was digging around that passage, that word deceive is very interesting. In the Greek, uh, that word uh, deceive, I won't bore you with this, but the word is paralogizomai. And in the middle of that is the word logos. That's the root word right there in the middle of it. And, and, and that kind of struck me as interesting. And so I've been exploring that and, and to figure out what this is saying. And literally what James is saying is that word deceive means there's a way of thinking. You can, you can put one way of thinking up against the word of God, a different, like the reason of God, the speaking of God. So you put them side by side and you choose the other way. And you so deceive yourselves. That's literally what he's saying there. James is saying, don't just hear the word of God and what he's saying to do, and then put something else opposed to the word of God side by side, and then do the other thing, right? You put something else side by side with the speaking of God, the word of God, and then do something else. That's called sin. It's disobedience. We're going to be in the book of James this morning, and, and I expect this to be challenging, uh, if you ever read the book of James, it's always challenging. Uh, so if you have your scripture with you, um, turn with me to the book of James. And before we do, I just want to say, uh, are, are, let me ask you to settle something in your heart today. Before we dive into God's word, are you, are you, are you committed to what God says to do? So God, as, as a believer, we come in here. And we look at what God's word says, and, and God's word says, hey, this is, the do, this is what you should do. This is my instructions to you. This is the way to live. Are you committed to whatever that is before we even read it? I think that so many times we come into the church, and in our whole lives in general, we come into the church and, and we say, absolutely, I'm surrendered to the word of God. I'm committed to the word of God. Can I hear it first? That's okay if we do that with one another, right? Someone comes to you in the foyer and says, hey, do me a favor. You're like, sure. There's a part of you that's like, what is it? Right? You might ask me to do something that's nuts. And, but, so, yeah, I'll do, I'll do the favor for you, but what is that favor? There's that little reservation. It's not okay to do that with the word of God. As a follower of Jesus, that, that's not surrender, right? It's like I am surrendered to the Lord. I am surrendered to the word of God. What, that's what that word Master, Lord, it's curios in the Greek. That's what it means, full surrender. You say it, I'll do it. Are you surrendered to the Lordship of Christ? When God says do it, I'm going to do it. I believe that's what God wants for his church. For us to live that way, for it to be a people who we gather here together and we, when we study the word of God, we look at what Jesus has to say to us and we say, I surrender all. Before you even say what it is, I'm surrendered in obedience to the Lord. He's a loving father. He's not going to ask me 
to do something that's, that's not for my good and for his glory. Amen. Um, he's not going to do something to harm me. His will is better than mine. His plan is better than mine. And, and so I'm going to trust him completely. I would ask you, can you surrender that and, and come to that, that place of settlement in your heart today? Did you look at James chapter 4, if your Bible is open, James chapter 4? Throughout the book of James, I mentioned it's challenging. James is a challenging book of Scripture to read. He deals with a number of subjects, and the link that, that I think ties all of those things together throughout James, and they are tests of God's people, tests, maybe you could say, to God's pe- people of, of a living faith, of a genuine faith, a saving faith. And here in chapter 4, he gives us some pretty serious stuff about living as Christ wants us to live. And so as people who are pursuing holiness, chasing after God, seeking after God, wanting to be shaped into the image of Christ and live our lives for him, I think this is incredibly useful information. So James chapter 4, if you have your Bible with me, lean into somebody else if you don't have one and Read along if we put the words on the screen for you. We're going to pick it up at verse 11 together. This is what James writes. He says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you... Who are you to judge your neighbor? Very strong words from James. Um, James is obviously very spe- specific, if I can spit that word out, very specific in this text. But, but I would encourage you this morning to, to kind of have a, a, a mindset of, of maybe viewing this and receiving this message with an overarching view of sin. Because we're going to focus on slander. James breaks down slander in the text here. But I want you to view this as an overarching view of sin because you could plug and play anything in there with the points we're going to make today. Because James teaches us here, and this applies across the board to sin, okay? But we're going to focus on slander for a moment, and, and let's begin with what it means to slander since that's what he specifically mentions here in verse 11. What is slander? Well, um, typically I think when we think of slander, we, we sit on this idea of deception, that someone is lying about another person, right? And so if, if someone slanders you or you know about slander, if you're caught up in slander, we justify it because, well, I'm not lying about anybody, right? I, what, what I said was true, right? I, didn't, I wasn't lying about it. What, what I said is truthful. I believe it's truthful. It may either be true or I believe it to be true. And so is it really slander? What I said is true about them. And that's not the thrust of this word. The, the, the thrust of this word is in the, 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 the prefix in the Greek is kata, which means against. Literally what it's saying is do not speak against someone. Okay? It's this whole idea of speaking something that is against another individual with the intention of lowering someone else's view about that individual, okay? And James says that's sinful, okay? The Bible says, I don't know if you knew this, that we're not supposed to let anything out of our mouths that is destructive. Did you know that? Ephesians 4, 29, the Apostle Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk, that word means corrupt or rotten, it's destructive, It, it tears down and ruins and destroys. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others, that it may benefit those who listen. So not just that you're tearing one person down, but it's also not benefiting and could possibly be hurting the person you do it to, or say it to, right? We're not supposed to tear down or be against. We're supposed to be building up. Don't let anything come out of your mouth that isn't useful for that reason. Now, obviously, there are times when we have to say hard things to each other. We need to challenge one another. We need to, we need to be firm. We need to be strong. We need to say difficult things, confront someone on certain things, especially with regards to sin. Okay? But again, our whole focus, our point should be that you are for them. It's done in the effort to build up and to encourage and to strengthen and to heal 
never to tear down. And when we slander or literally speak against another person, it is never done with the intention of building up. Okay? Now, maybe you would say, man, I, I, I never intentionally try to tear someone down. That's not my goal. Okay? I, I would just say to you uh, what James says in, back in verse 22 of chapter 1. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. God says something. Don't put something up against it and choose that. And what he says to do is do not slander. Okay. What would it do for the testimony of the church? Both the, those who are already in the fold and to the world who is not in the building, hopefully yet. Not in the fold of the church. If they believed in their heart, the church was a safe place. There's no way the people of God would talk about me. There's no way the people of God would say so. They're followers of Jesus, and they're not merely hearers of the word. They do it. And so they're going to be obedient to the teaching of Jesus. That's a safe place for me to be in. That's a place I want to be in. What would it do for the testimony of the church If it was a safe place. Jesus says this in Matthew 12. Verse 34. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. James is getting in line here with Jesus. And he's saying, when, what you speak in your mouth, what comes out of your mouth, indicates the condition of your heart. Okay? And if that is a slanderous tongue, habitually speaking against other people, what it reveals is an unchanged heart. Okay? Jesus would go on to say a few verses later in Matthew 12, by your words you will be justified. The justification is right being in good in right standing with Christ, okay? You'll be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Why? Because the words that come out of your heart are revealing the condition of your heart. So as people who are pursuing holiness, I hope that's why you're here, I'm seeking after Jesus, you want to know God more, you want to be closer to him, you want to learn the character of Jesus and, 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 and seek after the character of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, the things of the kingdom of God, right? I hope that's why you're here. As we are people who want to do that and pursue righteousness, I want to point us to several things that I believe are exposed here, just by way of understanding. When we're talking about exposing a sinful heart, uh, when it comes to the issues of sin, what do we see? So here's the first one. If you're a note taker, I encourage you to write these points down, uh, the scripture references down inside your bulletin. Uh, you can find a place to do that if you don't have a piece of paper with you. Here's the first one. The sin of slander reveals what we think about others. So it reveals in our heart what we really think about others. And again, this is, a, this is an overarching view. I would encourage you to look at that. So you could say, uh, just in general, that sin reveals what we think about others. Wouldn't have to just be slander. But Notice verse 11. Uh, James says, brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or, or judges his brother. So multiple times the reference is made here so that we are conscious of the fact that that, that that slander or speaking against someone within the community of faith is slander against whom? A brother or sister. Okay. This, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a violation of Philippians chapter 2 with the, the, against the humility of Christ. Okay. It's a violation of this, this principle to not look at, to your own interest but look to the interest of others. A violation of this, this, this instruction to... to uh, Consider others better than yourself, right? It's a violation of the attitude that we see in 1 John 2 and in, in, in chapter 4, which say if you're a believer, that ought to manifest itself by you loving your brother. And so this causes us to be introspective a little bit, take stock of, of our hearts, and, and what do our hearts reveal about the way that we feel about others? Do we really love other people? So you could say if you're going to have a tongue which reflects the condition of your heart and, and speaks well of others and not against them, it's going to be first and foremost because you understand who it is you're speaking about. 
you, you're, you, you'll understand that people, the Bible calls them children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. They are the objects of, of Jesus, the Savior, who gave his very life for them. Someone who is precious to God. So if I can see Christians, fellow Christians, as God's children, whom he loves, whom he died for, if I can see them, maybe not like I see my own family members, but brothers and sisters in the faith, if that's what I, uh, my heart reveals, that's who they are to me, then, then, then I won't speak about them like that. I can control how I talk about them. That's, that's the issue. Okay? Look in your scripture to Matthew 18 for a moment. I want to enforce this with the teaching of Jesus. Matthew chapter 18, and, and, and uh, for many of you, this passage will likely uh, be familiar. I just want to preface it by saying that Jesus is not talking about babies. He's not, really, he's not even talking about real children. He's talking about spiritual children, okay? He's talking about having a childlike faith. This is Matthew 18, verse 2. He, this Jesus, called a little child to him and placed the child among them. That actually is a real child, a little person, okay? And he said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child, again, not, not a real child, but a spiritual child, child he's talking about a childlike believer and and can i just say to you that we're all childlike believers until we reach that maturity when we stand face to face with christ amen so we are maturing along the way we're all like children whoever receives one such child in my name receives me jesus says so in other words how you treat another believer is exactly how you treat christ do you hear that today how you treat another believer is exactly how you treat Christ. We talk about all the time, like, uh, what you do for the least of these, Jesus says. And, and, and nine times out of ten, we're, we're typically referring to those outside the walls of the church. We're talking about people out in the community. We're talking about people who are down and out, down on their luck that you encounter. Uh, um, this is inside the church. These are brothers in Christ. How you treat this other believer is just how you treat me, Jesus says. And that's why in verse 6 he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones, these believers, those who believe in me, whoever causes this person to sin, to stumble, to fall away, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fast around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. In other words, you're better off dead than the, for your disobedience to cause another believer to fall away, to stumble and fall in sin. Pretty aggressive from Jesus here. Verse 7, he says, Woe to the world. That word woe is pretty heavy. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. See, the world tempts Christians. The world offends Christians, doesn't it? That's what they do. And we expect it. We expect the world to offend Christians. We expect the world to tempt Christians. We certainly don't expect the church to to offend believers. We don't expect believers to tempt and offend other believers. And so Jesus is saying in verse 8 and 9, if you're doing it, you better take serious action. Okay, and so he goes on and he talks about uh, some proverbial statements like if, if, you, if your hand or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off, right? If your eye cause you to sin, gouge it out. He's not talking about chopping off limbs and cutting out eyes. He's saying you need to take some serious action with regards to sin in your heart, okay? Take a drastic action if you're sinning against someone else, in this case, a believer. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. That means, like, don't, don't look down or think poorly of them. For I tell you that in heaven, the angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. He's, he, the reference there, he's talking about the angels are looking on the face of the Father. And when this is taking place, the face of the Father reflects his, sag, his sadness, his anger, that this has happened to his children, and those angels will be sent in the aid of the believers who are being hurt. So he's saying they're watching the Father. The Lord is the kind of shepherd 
that has 100 sheep. And he could have 99 in the fold, but will go and find the lost and missing sheep and bring them back into the fold. That's how precious his children are to him. He doesn't want any of his children to be led astray or to perish. Right? See, we need to take, take stock of this. When, when we speak against another believer, we backbite or gossip or criticize or, or, or speak to harm them or ruin the reputation, discredit them, just remember who you're doing it to. These, these are the beloved of God. These, this is God's prize creative possession, I guess you could say. The crown jewel in all that God has done. To create you. It's very important how we treat each other. What does my heart reveal about the way that I treat other people? If I see my fellow believer as as a child of God, as, as someone that Jesus went to the cross for, to save them, they should be protected and forgiven and nurtured and care for, if I see them in that way, that's going to absolutely affect how I talk about them, isn't it? I'll never say anything that isn't for the purity of their heart and for the purity of the church. And, and if I lie and slander and as a pattern of my life, I, I do this, James is saying, there's every reason to question the legitimacy of my faith, the legitimacy of my Condition of my heart and my claim to salvation. Pretty darn stern. Welcome to church. Next one James gets into. He's, he's going to follow progression. You'll see this here. That sin reveals what we think about God's law. Okay? It reveals what our heart, what we feel about other people. And what we think about God's law. James says anyone who speaks against a brother... Or judges them. That, that word actually means condemns. So you're speaking against someone to condemn them. You also speak against the law and judge the law. And when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, right? You're merely a hearer and not a doer. You're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. So he says, when you speak against someone, you're speaking against the very law of God. What does that mean? Well, if you were to back up a couple chapters in James, in chapter 2, verse 8, he refers to the royal law of Scripture. Anyone know what that is? The royal law of Scripture? Right, that's, that, he says that's love your neighbor as you love yourself. Right? When Jesus was asked, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said that, that's, the, that's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second part is like it or equal to it. Equal in rank to it, that word means. So just as equal in rank as loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind is this instruction to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the greatest commandment in the law. Okay? So the, the, the sin of speaking against someone, the disobedience in that is in the lack of love. Okay? See, in order to speak against someone, you can't really love them. Now, we all mess up. Don't get me wrong, okay? This is, this is a habitual slander. If this, is, if this is what's coming out of your heart, then you don't really love this person. You can't bring them down and speak against them and love them at the same time, okay? He says, you're breaking the royal law, which says to love this other person as I love myself. In other words, if you don't treat people right, you break the law. A breach of love is a breach of the law. A violation of love is a violation of law because God gave us his law To regulate our love toward him and to regulate our love towards each other. Okay? So if we're speaking against someone and defaming them and speaking maliciously and and get our tongues wagging with with gossip and slander and backbiting and negative conversations, saying things that aren't true, we're we're violating the very heart of God's law. And it shows a complete and utter disregard for the divine standard that God gave us. Okay? Okay? See, this is much deeper than just watching your mouth and not saying something negative about another person. Okay? This strikes at the very heart of the greatest commandment that Jesus gave to us. Okay? God isn't asking you to, to watch your mouth or to bite your tongue. Okay? This, is, this is God illuminating our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can reveal the condition of our hearts. 
and reveal what the condition of our hearts says about the law, what it thinks about the law. See, understand this. When, when, when you hear the law of God and you put something else side by side with it and choose the other thing, what you're really deciding is that you don't believe that, that, that the law of God is something that you should be under. Right? Think about any crime. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. Right? When, when, you, when you steal something or, 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 or break the speed limit, or I don't care what it is, you, you violate the law. It's the law of the land. Basically what you're saying is, I, I don't really need to be under that law. Right? I've got my own circumstances. Uh, I've got this going on in my heart and in my life. This is why I'm doing it. We justify it, right? I don't need to be under this law. That's what we're saying, okay? And the Bible says when you do that with the law of God, what you're doing is you're criticizing. You're, 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 you're sitting in judgment of it. And I think we need to understand that the enemy has been deceiving and tricking the people of God into doing this since the very beginning, since the garden, the enemy will, 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 will trick the people of God to taking something that is written absolutely in black and white to put something else up beside it, and he tricks us into choosing the other thing. Did God really say that I shouldn't do that? I mean, I, was, I didn't mean any harm. I, I mean, I, did he really mean I shouldn't talk against somebody else? Surely God knows my circumstance. It's different. This person offended me. They did something to me. I mean, there's an exception to this, isn't there? And we start to question what God said. Did God really say that? Did, does, does the word of God really limit my sexual activity outside the marriage bed? Does, does God really say I shouldn't put my mind and engage my mind in this sort of sinful thought? Is that really what he's saying to me? Is God really trying to limit my choices and my thoughts? Is he really free to say that I can't do this with my life and live this way? And the enemy tricks us into saying that. Uh, rather than just saying, this is what the word of God says. Wow, okay. I'm going to live in obedience. I'm going to get under the word of God. We start sitting in judgment of it. Is that really what he means? And, and James says, when you disobey what you're doing is revealing in your heart what, what your heart really thinks about the law of God. See, your prayer when you leave here today, my prayer when I leave here today shouldn't be, God help me to not say negative things about them. Your prayer should be, God help me to love them like you love them. Because then it'll never happen. Are you willing to pray that kind of prayer? That's a serious prayer. Are you willing to say, God, would you forgive me? Cleanse my heart because I want to get rid of animosity. I don't want to feel this way about someone else. I don't, I, 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 I don't want to not love this person. I want to love this person the same way that I love myself because that's what it looks like to love you and to glorify you. Well, James isn't through with the logic. He goes a step further. If you want to follow the third thought down this path. That this sin of slander not only reveals what we think about others and what we think about the law of God, but also that, that this sin reveals in our heart what we actually think about God himself. This is his logical pro progression here. Look at the first part of verse 12. He says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. What, what he's saying there is, is there's no room for you and me on the judge's bench. Okay? The judge is on the judge's bench. Get off. That's what he's saying. Okay? See, church, I think we need to, we need to wrap our heads around this, that, that there is no room, there's no vacancy in the Trinity. Okay? God is not waiting for me to show up, not waiting for you to show up to start calling the shots. And, and when someone chooses to disobey God and to put himself above the law, effectively, he takes the bench and attempts to dethrone or dispossess God. 
You might hear that and go, whoa, wait a minute, wait. I, I am not trying to dethrone God. There's no, that's not what I'm trying to do. I am not trying to dispossess God from his rightful place. But see, effectively, that's what sin is. That's what we do when we choose to disobey God. Let me show this to you. We often talk about that moment back in the Garden of Eden where, where sin entered the garden through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. I want to take a step back from that because you can see in Scripture the precursor to their sin in the fall of the enemy, in the fall of Satan. And I want to read this to you. There's a couple different places where you see the fall of Satan. And this is what the Bible says about that in Isaiah chapter 14. They're speaking, of, speaking to the devil, I guess you could say. You said in your heart... I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reach of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Do you hear that? Five times. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. That he sought the place of supremacy. Okay? That the enemy sought to come out from under the mighty hand of God, out of a surrendered position under the mighty hand of God, to be above God and to be in charge. And the essence of sin, and every sin to follow is the same thing. Every sin is based in, I will, I will, I will. And it is a desire, whether we realize it or not, to usurp that role of judge, to usurp that, that position of the one sitting on the bench. To not God off the bench and to be in charge of my own life. Okay? I'm going to be above the law instead of under the law. It all stems from pride. I will. This is what I'm going to do. Okay? All sin violates God's law. Any, anytime where we disobey a known law of God, what we're asserting is that as a sinner, I'm above the law. And that strikes a direct attack at the lawgiver himself. Why? Because every sin, in effect, condemns the law and, and seeks to usurp that role of authority. I'm the one in charge, and so I will. It's all pride. You become the lawgiver. You write your own law, and, and, and you push God off the bench. And the unspoken message of that is, friends, that I wish God was out of the picture so that I could be in control. That's essentially what sin says. That was Satan's disobedience. That was his position in sin. And that's the prototype of every sin that every person has committed since then. I see what God says. I'm going to put mine up side by side, and I'm choosing the other way. See, the law is the expression of who God is. Right? This is the character and the heart of God breathed out for you and me to follow and to obey and to grow in and, and, and to pursue righteousness in. And to disregard and to disobey the law is to devalue the law and, and, and say my opinion, my word, my statement, my truth is, is higher or more important than the law, than the word of God, than the logos of God himself, the speaking of God. To kick God off the throne and to set myself up as the ultimate authority. James says there's only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy. God is the one who gave the law, and he's the one who will judge men by that law. He's both lawgiver and law applier. The one who is able to save and destroy. That's how he applies the law, right? The application of the law is he saves those who are protected from the law by the shed blood of Christ and my faith in Jesus. And he destroys those who are unprotected because of no faith in Jesus. He's the one who has the right to do that because he's the lawmaker and the lawgiver. I don't have that right. There's only one lawgiver. Only one can create and apply the law. There's only one who has the power to acquit by mercy through faith in Christ and, and the power to condemn. And that's God. That's God. And James is saying to us, when you choose, in this case, to use your words to speak against someone else. In your heart, what it's revealing is that you're, God, get God off the bench. I am the judge. I'm the judge. 
The final one is sin reveals what we think about ourselves. James asks a very uh, uh, illuminating, I think it's a hum humbling question here. He says, this is who God is. He's the lawgiver. He's the judge. He's the one who can save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Who in the world do you think you are is basically what he's saying. You're questioning one of God's commands. Who are you and why do you think that you have the right to question anything God has spoken? That's what James is saying to us today. If I look in the mirror and that's what God's saying to me, who do you think you are? Right? And there's this earth, tiny little earth floating around in this mind-bogglingly vast cosmos with a tiny of bunch of tiny little people on it and God spoke it all into creation he created the law he says here's here's the way that you should live here's the way you shouldn't live he alone has the power to save and to condemn it's all up to him he's the one who can sit in judgment of the law he's the one who spoke it and revealed his law to us and friends you and I don't get to say so you know what I mean we don't get to say so and in our culture, we have a trouble hearing that. Because I'm free to say anything I want, aren't I? Under the First Amendment, I can stand up, I can say, I can get online, I can say what I want, and as long as I don't violate, you know, somebody's policy or whatever. I can say what I want about who or anything I want. I can tell you this, tell you that, to make, to make my thoughts known and, 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 and to speak my mind, to throw out my opinion. I have the right to do this, and nobody can tell me not to. That's our country. So we have a hard time hearing this and processing this. And yet the Bible says, who are you and why are you of the opinion that your thoughts on the matter are important to anyone? I don't mean your life. I don't mean your stuff in your life. You want to tell about your Aunt Susie's chili recipe, knock yourself out. I'm talking about the, the things of God. Who are you? To believe your matter... Your, your, your opinion on the matter needs to be shared with the world. That's what James is saying here. See, I think the church, I'm not talking about PCN. This isn't a, this isn't a hey, hey, you guys. This is the church of God needs to hear this today. Because the world sees something else when you talk about church. The world doesn't, doesn't see a group of people living this. Okay, That we might take a step back today and consider as the church that we could be sitting in judgment of God's law. Questioning his commands. Rather than just saying, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm going to shut my mouth, be quiet, and do what God says to do. The Lord have mercy on us. Who am I to judge my neighbor? Lord, forgive me for ever judging one of you. That I would look at a, a, a fellow brother or sister, any person for that matter, and deem in my heart that you or someone else is not worthy of the same love that Jesus shed on the cross for me. It's the power of a slanderous tongue. It can... It, it, it not only can create havoc in the world, but it slanders God himself. So James, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is, is cut and dry. Stop doing it. I want to invite you this morning, every single one of us, and it doesn't have to be a slander issue, to search our hearts. To search your heart today. You can plug and play a different word if slanders doesn't resonate with you this morning. But do a little inventory of what our heart speaks about how we see other people, how we see the law of God, how we view God himself and how we, what position we put our place in by the way that we live our lives. And if we have spoken against someone, spoken unfairly or unjustly or without cause or, or spoken lies or words of backbiting or gossip, whatever that looks like in our lives, 
I would just ask you, now's the time for confession. If there's somebody here that you know you've hurt today, would you go to them? If there's somebody outside the walls of here, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, and that, that, there's, there's friction there, there's something, and you know that you've wronged them, would you go to them? Would you seek repentance and ask God to change your heart and say, Lord, give me the words, I need, I need to make this right. See, seeking after God is a pursuit of a life of holiness. It's a pursuit of a life of, of a genuine, saving faith. And James says, this is what it looks like. 